Hello, it's my pleasure today to be with Ralph Gomery, the former director of IBM Research, past president of the Sloan Foundation, and a research professor at New York University. My name's Irv Lustig from Princeton Consultants. And we're here to learn today about Ralph's storied career that ranges from contributions in integer programming to his work at leading IBM Research, to his work at the Sloan Foundation, and finally, his research career at New York University. So Ralph, I want to thank you for coming and arranging for this interview today. Well, thank you for being here and doing it. All right, so let's start off with your early yeah. life. Oh, um, yes. Can you tell us uh, where and when you were born? Yes, I was born uh, in Long Island College Hospital, um, which is in Brooklyn, New York, uh, right adjacent to Brooklyn Heights. and. Um, my mother and father lived there. Yeah. Um, my dad was a banker. He was born in Hungary and came over here for his first job and never went back. And uh, my mother uh, came from a very, uh, from a Jewish family that was well established. Uh, came here, I think, around 1848. And so did you grow up then in Brooklyn? Yes, I did, yes. And your, uh, so tell us, did you have any siblings? I had an older brother, yes, yeah. And uh, did yeah. he end up doing things, uh, anything related no, to what you did? completely unrelated. Completely yeah. unrelated. Yes, yeah, yes. And you mentioned your father was a banker. Did yeah. your mother uh, have a profession? Oh, in those days, first of all, you have to realize <coughs> that my growing up was in the, the 1930s. And in those days, uh, women did not, middle class women did not work, mm -hmm. except possibly as teachers. But usually if they were married, they didn't work. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. so did you tell us about your early uh, mm -hmm. education in yes. Brooklyn? Yes. Well, <clears throat> my early education, I think, was absolutely different and decisive. And I think really, I doubt whether I would have uh, amounted to anything without it. I was extremely lucky uh, that I went uh, to an unusual school. It was called the Woodward School, and it was founded by Miss Woodward. And uh, uh, they gave us a lot of freedom. I mean, we learned what we had to learn. We all on the rare days when we were, were, did standardized tests and stuff, we all did well, all right, very well. But they managed to make it fun. We did projects a lot of the time. And I got it into my head that learning stuff and understanding stuff was fun. Not the usual, oh, I've got to get this uh, and, <clears throat> and we did some am pretty ambitious uh, projects. W one of them is worth really mentioning, that we wrote a book, three of us. As a novel? A, a novel, right. Uh, Do you recall what it was about? M more than recall, <laughs> all right? Because, as you'll see, uh, we're working on it right now, all right? Uh, it was about three children who, by mistake, stowed away on a sailing ship, a clipper ship, 1848, about that period. Uh, and unexpectedly, it went to China with them on board and their adventures with pirates, everything. Okay. And uh, it was 120 pages, okay, three authors one of whom died, and uh, we wanted to get it published, and some publishers actually considered it. And, but it, it didn't. So it was stowed away in an envelope with a skull and crossbones on it saying, you know, whoever touches this is, will be cursed forever, or words <laughs> to that effect. Okay. And to my amazement, uh, <coughs> One, one, the other surviving person had it. We opened it up, and inside were several copies of the book on onion skin, if you 
Well, yes. Okay, if you know what onions. It, it, you couldn't scan it. It was too difficult. We had it typed. And <clears throat> we're just going through it now, writing an introduction. And um, it's in Word. And um, we're going to send it to our me all the members of our families and whoever else is interested. And amazingly, it's interesting. Now, how old were you when this project occurred? Yeah, we, we were, I think, in the sort of 10 to 12 range. Wow, that's pretty, that's yeah. very interesting. And it's, and it's yeah. really nice that you've been able to keep in, in oh, I didn't, touch I with couldn't, your childhood friend. I, yeah, well, we, we, we were apart most of the time. We came together when, when uh, one of us was dying. And uh, I read her from some of our childhood books that we shared. But I had no idea that that thing was there. And, uh, so it probably brought back some good memories. What? It probably brought back some good memories. Yeah. And there are even uh, some uh, photographs with it, you know, of us when we were children. Yeah. So, so, so the school yeah. that you went to. Yes, Woodward, um, yeah. You were, were you there? Was that like a first grade through 12th grade experience? No. It was um, third through eighth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I can only say I really enjoyed that school, and it was it spoiled me for every school I ever went to subsequently, because they didn't live up to it wasn't exciting and fun. It was <laughs> So I, I guess your high school experience in ninth through 12th grade was more of the uh-uh. It was the uh-uh time. It, yeah. and, and, and where was that? Well, I, I went briefly to something called um, a poly prep in Brooklyn, and then to to a boarding school near Phil, uh, in Pennsylvania uh, called George School. It's a Quaker school, mm -hmm. Quaker school, yeah. And that was an interesting place, yeah. And it was a co-ed boarding school, which you know in the 1930s, right? And uh, I got a lot out of that too, but it wasn't. Uh, uh, it wasn't like Woodward. Yeah. So, what subjects were you interested in and and, and good at while you were in school? Well, <clears throat> I was. Uh, I seemed to be naturally good at physics. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, the teacher got tired of having me in the room and said I didn't have to come anymore. Right. And. Um, on the other hand, I was terrible at math because I didn't understand it. And one of the things, I, I'm never comfortable with just remembering things. I, I really want to understand them. And the way math was taught, <coughs> it was like you do this, you do this, and you do this, and then the answer comes out. I didn't understand why I was doing this and doing this, and I wasn't good at remembering it. So I had, uh, didn't, didn't score well on math aptitudes and things like that. And in fact, when my advisor, um, when I was going off to college, my advisor uh, asked me what I thought I would uh, study. And I said I wanted to study physics. And by the way, the reason I wanted to study physics was because it explained so much. You know, it explained why you could fall downstairs. Uh, what happens when you, uh, uh, when it's raining. And I mean, it explained the world around me. And that's what I like doing, is understanding the world around me, okay? And um, said, don't, you can't do that probably because you're so poor at mathematics, okay? But um, fortunately, that one day, I caught on. And, and that one day was in, in when you got to college or later on? No, it was, it, it, was once, it was the summer, I think, before I went to college. You see, I was a very enthusiastic um, small boat sailor, and if you know anything about sailboats, you know that when they're progressing against the wind, 
they, uh, they zigzag. They can't go straight into the wind, right. okay? And so I, I became curious about how much extra distance do I have to go through the water when I'm going against the wind? And all of a sudden, it turned out, well, the answer involved sines and cosines. So all of a sudden, oh, that's what those things are for. <laughs> okay? And that's why you have to use these things. And so I caught on. I see. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and yeah. Do, did you think that there was anything, I guess in terms of you're trying to understand the physical world, yes. that there were things that ended up being served as a foundation for any of the later work you did in optimization? Not, no, I don't think so. Uh, what actually happened is that when I got to um, uh, college, and I went to Williams College, um, I, I studied physics, for, and, and, and I was a physics major, and I did well at it. Uh, but I lost interest in it. And the reason I lost interest in it was because physics stopped explaining the world around me. You, you get into quantum mechanics and stuff, or the forces inside the atom. Well, that doesn't tell you anything. Okay? You can't see an atom. You can't see an atom, all right? And you can't, it, it doesn't do anything that you can see and it changes the world around you. And that was why I got into physics. And so I thought, well, this is not good, okay? And I wanted to switch to economics because it seemed from the, that that economics was busy understanding the world around. But it was too late. I couldn't uh, major in economics. And so I... Um, decided to uh, major in mathematics because it turned out that I'd taken enough math in connection with the physics that I could still major, I could become a math major. Now you mentioned that you, yeah. this was at Williams College. Yes. Um, what made you choose to go to Williams? Uh, a very good reason. Right? I visited the campus and it looked beautiful. And, that's, and that was it? That, that well, there was a group, oddly enough, there was a group of us that thought we would go uh, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to that school. All of us had sort of the same reaction. So why don't we all apply? One of them was Steve Sondheim. The, oh, right, yeah. yes. And um, we were all admitted, and we all went. But you see, uh, we didn't understand, nor did our parents, that um, there's a difference between a college and a university, for example. Right. And I should have gone to a university, probably. And um, so anyway, I, I um, ended up uh, being a math major. And it was um, the same story. I mean, <clears throat> I, could, I did it. I could do it. But what I really enjoyed was exp uh, project, right? And so I wrote a thing, senior thesis. And this topic was? Boundaries for the limit cycle of Van der Poel's equation. Catchy? It sounds like a math thesis. <laughs> it was. <laughs> uh, uh, but it, it, was, um, it was pretty good. And it ended up being published. In, a, in yeah. an academic journal? Yeah. I stayed on that summer. My math teacher, who saw apparently a lot of promise in me, uh, invited me to stay that summer. Uh, and we published and fixed this thing up and published it as a joint paper in, I don't know what, Siam or something. I mean, a real journal. Really? Yeah. That's, a, yeah. a, that's pretty good as for an undergraduate uh, yes. student in mathematics to get a publication. Right. It, it really was. And uh, um, So yeah, you mentioned yeah. earlier how yeah. Yeah. when you were in at uh, 
at the Woodward School about yeah. how you had yeah. there was projects. Yeah. And then you alluded to yeah. that there were seemed to be were there projects that you also did while at Williams. This this was the first chance I had to do a project. Project. Okay. The senior thesis. The senior thesis. Yeah. Okay. I was so happy to be able to do what I wanted rather than what was due the next day. I see. Okay. I see. Yeah. And uh, so then I went for a year to Cambridge, England, uh, which turned out to be very fortunate because uh, I wasn't ready for graduate school because what they taught in Williams and what was expected of a graduate student, there was a huge gap. And then, can you describe what that gap was at the time? Well, uh, we had never, uh, we never heard of Epsilon and Delta. Okay. All right. Nothing, no, no rigorous anythings. Okay. Okay. I think we had advanced counting fields for engineers uh, as, as our senior. I mean, we were way out of it. Right? Okay. But fortunately, I went, uh, it was, uh, I spent a year at Cambridge, England, uh, for no very good reason, right? Except that it seemed my dad always uh, wanted us to see other countries, mm -hmm. right? because he came from Hungary and it had been a great advantage to him and, and he was educated in Germany and to know different countries. And, and, and he knew the head of uh, one of the Cambridge colleges and I went there. So in what year was this? That would be 1945, the year 45, 46. Right, so this is just yeah. after World War II. Yes. Um, so, the, yes. so, and what, was, what did you do while you were in Cambridge? Well, I'll tell you, but the, actually we sort of skipped over one thing, although when you mentioned the war, yeah. Because something happened that was very, very important to me and, and affected uh, things I did later in my life. I was too young to be in the Army but there was a great shortage of labor. And so they organized kids my age to go and work on the farms in place of the, people, of the men. Yeah. I see. And so I spent a summer working on the farm, hoeing corn, stuff like that. This is while you were in, one of your summers while you were in college? No. This was before college. Before college, That's okay. Right. Yeah. And it made a huge impression on me. I was so impressed with the farmer, right? The farmer could go down a row of corn twice as fast as any of us, or maybe three times. It wasn't because he was stronger. We had some pretty big boys. His skill. Well, he could do all kinds of things. He could do a horse-drawn cultivator. Can you imagine a horse-drawn cultivator? And um, I was really impressed how, how much he knew how to do and how skillful and thoughtful he was. A person who would, I doubt, had ever gone through high school. Mm -hmm. And it, it made a permanent impression on me, although you go to college and you're surrounded by college-educated people, that there's another world of people and that you should not look down on them. Yes. They are different, but they are remarkable, okay? And that was a very important influence in my life. Okay, okay return to Cambridge. Uh, they, I, I won't go into various details, but basically I managed to fill in some of the gaps in my education. So, yeah. so it wasn't a degree program, it was just an opportunity to take some courses. Well, I might, when I arrived there, I thought maybe I'd stay for a degree, but I, I didn't, there, they, the way they did math didn't appeal to me at all. I see. Okay. <laughs> but it filled those gaps that were important. I, yeah, I managed to fill the gaps. Right. So yeah. after a year in Cambridge, what happened next? Well, I, I thought I would apply to uh, MIT because I really like um, applied things. I mean, I like understanding the world around me. Yeah. Uh, but then I got an invitation, a surprise, from the head of the Princeton Math Department to come to Princeton. And how did he know of your work? He had run into my professor, Don Richmond, 
And Don Richmond had told him, you, you ought to get this guy. And, and Don Richmond was at Williams? He was my professor, professor, math professor. At Williams. I should have mentioned his I name see. earlier. Okay. Yeah. He was a terrific person. And uh, so I thought, well, they seem to want me at Princeton. What the hell, I'll go, okay. And so I went to, uh, to Princeton. And, uh, oh, uh, and also, I forgot to say, the, this person, the Princeton person, Solomon Lefschetz, very interesting and, and good person. Uh, he was interested in differential equations, which was the subject on which my thesis, my undergraduate thesis, had been. So that was a connection, too. And so I, I, uh, Princeton wasn't so bad because the, the, they only had a few graduate students, uh, who, and they were a pretty uh, select group. And so you, you didn't have to go to classes at all. There was no class requirement they, for... They, uh, had cla they gave courses, but you, if, if you attended it, fine. If you didn't attend it, fine. What you had to do was pass an exam called the general exam. All right. Like qualifying exams and other similar yeah. qualifying exams in other universities. Yeah, except that it was even more minimal. Uh, you, you went into a room with three professors and they asked you a lot of questions. And it was, I, I think I remember reading yeah. you, uh, a story where you were saying yeah. that the questions were, you were expecting them to be far more difficult than they, they were. were yeah, than, I than was terrified, were. yeah. Cause the downside of, of not getting grades or, or, or attending courses or anything is you don't know whether you're doing well or badly. Okay. Anyway, I did fine. Now, at, yeah. you were, this yeah. is in, at what, what time period were you at Princeton? Well, I guess I uh, uh, arrived there in 51 or 52. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned that you, yeah. if I remember correctly, you said you finished yeah. college in 45, so we have, and you had a year in Cambridge, so yeah. there was some stuff in between there. Well, I was a class of 1950 at Williams. At Williams. Oh, so you yeah. started at Williams in 1945. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, It was interesting because I was so happy to have the generals behind me mm -hmm. and be able to do research. And it was very different because most of my classmates were very good at classes, but they'd never done any research. And so they, it was their turn to be terrified. I see. And so I, 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 uh, I very quickly got a thesis. I thought up things. Or I wrote a couple of papers uh, that were published. And, and One of them was my thesis. And, and what were the areas yeah. of mathematics they were in? It, they were nonlinear differential equations. Okay. 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 But, so I was being successful, but it, it, I just didn't want it, that to be my life. Now, yeah. Lefschetz was your thesis advisor as well. He was a very well. good guy, yeah. He was um, terrific, yeah. Now, you were also there yeah. around the time mm -hmm where there was a lot of math programming activity, um, uh, you know, a uh, lot of math programming activity at Princeton. What? I'm not catching the words. Math programming. Oh, math programming. Yeah. yeah. At, at Princeton. So, mm -hmm. you know, Al Tucker, Harold Kuhn was there around there, Nash, um, I, Shapley. Well, Shapley. Uh, the, I don't think they were. I think that was just a couple of years later. Okay. Yeah. Or at least I was not conscious of them. Okay. All right. Although, they, they, I, as you'll see, I, I come back and meet them all. Um, I just didn't want to spend uh, the rest of my life writing these papers, and I figured there maybe are 14 people in the world who could read them. Did you have any interactions with von Neumann? No, not at that time. Not at that time? Yeah. Uh, so I was just doing research on nonlinear differential equations. And, and so I thought uh, it would be time. It was time for me to go and and get a tenured position somewhere. I didn't want to do it. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I joined the Navy. Okay. Naturally, <laughs> because oh, you, you see, it's a little complicated. At that time, there was a draft. Okay. 
And, but no one I was in school, in graduate school with, really ever served because they were deferred as graduate students and then they became te professors. Teachers were deferred. Okay. But since I wasn't going to be a teacher, I was no longer deferred. And so I had to choose between um, two years in the uh, Army or Navy, or I could go to officer candidate school in the Navy for three, and sign, I, I signed up for three years. And so this is, yeah. you finished your PhD in what year? Yeah, 54. 1954. Yeah. So you, so you signed up for the Navy. Yeah, and, OCS. And what happens there? Well, I, got, I, I went to officer candidate school and learned a hell of a lot, right? Uh, they taught, uh, believe me, the, uh, the Army and the Navy, and I guess the Air Force too, they, they don't call it education, they call it training. But boy, they know how to do it. I mean, you get trained, okay? Right. And you know what your job is, it's to care, take care of your men and bear orders. So was there yeah. anything related to your mathematical training that you were doing at the Navy? Nothing. Nothing at all at that point. Okay. I joined the Navy because I was a small boat sailor. Okay. Right. The Navy looked at that and they said when I came out of those, uh, hey, I've got a lot of small boat sailors. We've got practically no PhD mathematicians. They sent me to Washington. I never got on a ship. Do, is that something that, that you at the time felt, wait a minute, I, I joined the Navy to be a sailor? I applied for minesweepers. <laughs> the smallest boat I could find. Find, right. Never made it. So what happened as, when you were sent down to Washington? I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. I was in the Office of Naval, office of Naval Research. And uh, relating to, uh, I learned a lot of things. I can give you a couple of examples. Please. I was there when Sputnik went out. Okay. I heard uh, President Eisenhower, he got on the radio to reassure the nation. People were very shook up. Right. The Russians are ahead of us. Okay. And he, he said, I'll never forget, he said, we have in both oceans submarines that could rise to the surface and fire missiles into the Soviet Union. Okay. And what he said was literally true, because I knew what we had. Right. That was the sort of thing that I, well, at that point, we had in each ocean one submarine. It was capable of rising to the surface and firing something called the Regulus missile, which was the most uh, totally useless. It was a subsonic aircraft, winged aircraft. So subsonic is slow. It had been used as a target drone for training. Okay. It would never have gotten anywhere. I mean, if you shot down, and you had to control it by radio, that was useless. So I, that was a tremendous lesson to me. Uh, that, uh, and Eisenhower was a very straight arrow guy, you know, as, 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 that these people do what they feel they have to. And that, that was important later in my life. And, uh, Another thing, I, um, I, I was in the physics branch, but down the hall there was a, the operations research group. And so I discovered operations research. I'd never heard of it before. And they, they like, I could do what I had to do and, and, and have time left over in the physics branch. And they were willing to let me go down the hall and help out the OR people. And so, uh, that, I, I really, oh, OR, operations research. This is understanding everything, okay? This is for me. So I decided I would become an OR person. So were there particular people there at the Navy in OR that were influential? No, not so much, but uh, they did 
uh, they, they, another weapon system they asked me to look at. Uh, it was a McDonnell Douglas thing. And it was to, to send something over the Soviet Union, and, and that something, whatever aircraft, had to be able to see the ground occasionally to know where it was. And they uh, said, and they had a computation which showed that um, they'd see the ground often enough. Right? And I looked at that and it just didn't look right. Yeah. So uh, I went down one Sunday to the Library of Congress and they, it turns out they have big green books giving the cloud cover everywhere on Earth. And no one believed that the Soviets were giving that stuff out. But I looked and there it was. Kiev, everybody. Cloud cover every day. And you could see that the clouds came in together. All right, so you had three days of solid cloud. Couldn't see the ground. The average was fine, but, and they had used the average, and they didn't think the green books were there. That ended that whole program. So I learned something else, which is, hey, all these things that people do and, and spend a lot of, it was going to be a few hundred million, money on and so forth, you can't, you got to look hard. Maybe it's not right. Okay, so I said I got educated that all these important companies and people and everything, not necessarily. Okay. So, ha so having been too exposed yeah. to OR at the Navy, right? Um, it, you're now your three-year term there is yes. up with it's officers up. candidate yeah. school. Yeah. Um, and you know OR is for you. What happens yeah. next? What happens next is that uh, Professor Lefschetz. Uh, writes to me and says, do you want to come? We'll make you Higgins Lecturer at Princeton. It's a prestigious lectureship. Okay. It's, it's not a tenure thing, but I thought, okay, I'll go back, learn OR. Okay. I'd taken a night course down in um, Washington, taught by Alan Goldman, uh, and I learned linear programming. Okay. I was quite impressed with it. Yeah. And uh, and, and Alan, was he, if, I know later he was at Johns Hopkins, what, where was he affiliated with at that time? I think it was not, it was not Johns Hopkins, maybe American University or mm -hmm. something, yeah. And that, we did night courses. And um, so I thought, well, look, I'll go to Princeton for a year. It'll look good on my resume and I'll really learn this stuff because Princeton's doing it right. then. Okay, so I go there. And all the people you named were there. Right. They may have been there before, but I couldn't see them. I see. Yeah, but I don't think so. It, it, it had become game theory and everything had taken off mm -hmm. during those three years. And so I stayed there a year. And, uh, oh, yeah. But the Navy guys, the OR guys, kept me as a consultant. So I went down. Okay. Okay. And they were using linear programming to design a task, a Navy task force. Up, you know, you have an aircraft carrier, you've got to have some destroyers with it and so forth. So uh, you, you need to figure out the number of ships and things like that mm -hmm. and how far they can, and they do need tankers. And they use linear programming to minimize the cost of the task force, the way, the way, how it was composed. But the trouble was that the answers came out things like two and a quarter aircraft carriers. They weren't whole numbers. And it wasn't clear what you did with two and a quarter aircraft carriers. You can fiddle around with it and decide, did they mean two or did they mean three? And they said, hey, it'd be really good if we could get, do linear programming and get whole number answers. Right? So I listened to that. I thought, yeah, that's, that's right. And it's, it, it should be doable. Right? I didn't realize that people had thought about this and thought it was not doable. Uh, because in, in, in ordinary um, 
linear equations. There are ways to solve for integer solutions. It's called Diophantine equation. Right. I knew about it. I said, there ought to be the equivalent thing in linear programming. And so I went back to Princeton and sat around <laughs> for about a week trying to convert the methods of the Diophantine equations into uh, a way to get whole number answers in linear programming. And I couldn't, couldn't do it. So then I said, look, what would you do if you really had to get an answer? I, so I said to myself, I would uh, solve it with linear programming and then uh, I would, oh, something hit me. Supposing the answer came out, uh, you had a, an objective function, which was also supposed to be integers, mm -hmm. and which had certain weights in it, I won't explain, but they were integer weights. Supposing the answer came out to be seven and three quarters of the objective function. That meant, because the integer, the restriction to integers made it harder, it couldn't be more than seven. Okay, if it was over seven, it could, the integer answer had right. to be less. And I said, "How? How did I figure that out?" It was just obvious. And I realized that anything that was maximal at that vert vertex and was non-integer could be pushed in to be integer, not just the objective function. Right. And that led to the development of the cutting planes. So I, anything that was optimal there could be pushed in if it didn't come out of the integer. And the, the Gomery fractional cuts were. And then I spent a month for showing the thing converged. Right, and back then, the yeah. idea was that yeah. you would keep applying the cuts yes. until you found the solution. Yeah, you had to show that you would eventually. Right. Yes, and that was non-trivial. And, and afterward, other people developed cuts, and they didn't converge and so forth. Right. So anyway, that's how that started. Now, did you have any yep. discussions with some of the other folks that we mentioned earlier while you were developing this? No, I just sat there. Okay. Yeah. And this is because. Yeah. One year that you were at Princeton. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. At the same time, I guess, as a lecturer, you were teaching some courses. Yeah. And yeah. In your, was the t coursework that you were teaching back in your old area of dif nonlinear differential equations? No, it was, I think I was teaching undergraduates calculus or something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, so this work occurs in that year. Yes. You come up with yeah. now this, which is I may have, yeah, it may have been two years. I think... I think I stayed a second year and I was promoted to assistant professor uh, because of this integer stuff. Okay. So, but, so yeah. th this becomes a pretty fundamental contribution to yeah. integer programming. Well, really starts well, integer it programming. It start, really started. <coughs> the, <coughs> uh, I can remember meeting uh, Martin Beale in the hall. He was a very good man. Uh, he died young, unfortunately. And, I see, he said, I see you're down to give the seminar next week. You know, what are you going to talk about? I said, how to solve linear programs and integers. And he looked at me and he said, that can't be done. <laughs> <laughs> that made me feel good. Yeah. And here yet you had your, uh, you had your convergence proof to show yeah, that it could, had, be yeah, yeah, it could be done. Um, so after this yeah. year, yeah. two, two, two years. You about two years at Princeton, you've mm -hmm. got yeah. this great and, contribution. And, 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 yeah. And that summer, I was invited out to RAND because they had a computer, a big computer. Ah, right. And I met Phil Wolf. Okay. And Phil and I became friends, and and we remained friends. Right. Yeah. Till he died. Yeah. Now at um, now you mentioned that yeah. the the Navy was solving these problems. Yeah. This is the mid '50s or yeah. so. Yeah. As linear programs. Yeah. What was their computational vehicles? What? I mean, how did they compute solutions? Well, they didn't have to compute. They just had to get an answer. Well, so they just, was it basically... I mean, they saw they'd get an LP, uh, linear programming answer, and decide, well, let's try 
Well, yeah, but how did they get the linear programming answers? Did they have some computational yes. computers that would oh, solve? They, they filled a room or two. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That's right. a very good point. They had them, Rand had them, but each one of them was a named object, right? you know. Right. So, yeah. and, so uh, and at Rand, yeah. I know there was some computational work being yes. done there at the yes. time. Yes, yes. Um, I think, if I remember, does that what Orchard Hayes was there, maybe, or he was here somewhere else? Uh, I don't know. Bellman was there. Bellman was there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I know Dan spent some time I th there too. I think George was there. Okay. Or he may have moved on to Stanford, but it was the center. Okay. Okay. At that time. Yeah. Right. And Phil uh, was enormously helpful to me because he he could go he could run he was allowed to put stuff on the computer. I see. I wasn't. Okay. Uh, and he put my stuff on for me. Oh, I see. Okay. So he was just great. So he was really probably your earliest collaborator in the area. Absolutely. No question about it. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. that's really nice. Yeah. Um, well, you know, my next question was, mm -hmm. wh what do we view as your main contributions to the area of operations research? And certainly, the Gomery cutting planes are uh, I think I, I think I think starting integer programming. And starting integer programming, for That's, sure. Uh, yes. Um, Although I've got lots of other things I could mention. <laughs> <laughs> well, so yeah. after these, you yeah. had a couple years at Princeton. Yeah. What happens next? Uh, then um, IBM Research was just starting up. And you see that, that was really where I wanted to be. Now, let me explain why. When I was a kid, I went to camp in the summer, and I enjoyed it, okay. And I read a book uh, or an, uh, a story by H.G. Wells about the future. And in this future, um, people didn't have to work because they had intelligent machines that did everything. And I thought, wow, what a great thing, right? Because then all year round, it could be like summer camp. We just, you know, did things that were fun, right? And I thought, why can't, why do we have to wait for the future? Because I'd seen newsreels and stuff uh, of very complicated machines in factories doing this, that, and the other thing. We, have, we can do that complicated things now, right? And so I thought about it and after a while. I realized that although those things were complicated, they were repetitious, okay? And that we didn't, we had the ability to make robot-like things, but we lacked anything to make them adapt and learn. That was missing. Okay. Now, when I was in the first time I saw a computer in the Navy and realized how it was, I said, ah, the intelligence has arrived. Okay, I want to be where that is. I see. Okay, and that was IBM. So I, I thought this is the future. I'm joining IBM. And they were just setting up a research uh, labs and a research division at that time, so I joined. Now you joined in what role? They made me the head of a, sm of a group of five people. Now, I think some of those people yeah. are names that uh, others would know, right? Uh, that are well-known I well -known think they all are. <laughs> <laughs> well, you? not all. But, but, but I would add one thing. Other th the thing was being set up by Manny Piori, Emmanuel R. Piori, who had been the head of the Office of Naval Research. So there was sort of a faint connection there, too. But there I was in my little group, all right, which consisted of... Benoit Mandelbrot, right. Paul Gilmore, T.C. Who, uh, and one, I can't, can't, can't remember the name of the other person, I think, uh, but it, I will eventually. And 
later on, I persuaded Phil Wolf to come and join us. Yeah. Now you were, yeah. so you were hired out of Princeton yeah. into a role where you were actually leading this group yes. of other mathematicians. Yes. Um, Don't forget, I was a trained officer. That's, ah, yes, yeah, so that's where it comes from. Okay, I was trying to make that connection. Yes, uh, okay. Uh, but, of course, it's a little different. Uh, anyway, so, but, but to my great disappointment, you see, there was no connection with anything. We were just there in buildings free to do things. To do research. Yeah, to do research, because uh, uh, one of the great delusions of the time was that if you just let, left people alone to do research, something great came out of it. Mm -hmm. Radar, the atom bomb, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that isn't right. You, you need problems, okay? But then, and that was another giant misunderstanding. And, uh, and all, all of the GE, everybody set up research labs at the same time. Yeah. When you say misunderstanding, it was a misunderstanding of the philosophy of setting up the lab. They thought something would happen that didn't, wasn't going to happen, in my opinion. Okay. 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 They were looking for that next great discovery. Yeah. Well, those are very rare. Yes. They, they do happen, and they're terribly important. Right? But most progress is much more incremental. Right? right. And in order to be incremental, you have to know what's there, so you can increment it. Anyway, I was so we struggled um, to get in touch with with us, and and Paul Gilmore and I uh, learned after much trial and error that they, there was a problem in paper mills about. Um, that looked like a linear programming problem. Right? They, they made these, these huge rolls of paper, but then they had to cut them up into sizes that people could use, mm -hmm. and there was waste. And you could formulate it as a linear programming problem, but the, the only problem was that um, there were uh, a few hundred million different ways you could cut these things. Right. right. And so that the linear programming f formulation involved hundreds of millions of columns and couldn't, you couldn't write them down, much less run them on a computer. And so we developed something called column generation, right. which was also very important. And that in turn, and that worked, and we went out and we sold these, we sold them computers. To, to do this. To solve it. So you, so it the, was real. It, it's actually, so, so the, this algorithm that you developed yeah. and yeah. implemented on a computer was used by multiple paper mills at the time. It, that's right. The, the, the uh, salesman, IBM salesman who took us there were really happy to have something to give them aside from time clocks and stuff. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, and there was a lot of, we had to prove we could do, get them better results than they were getting. Right. And we could mostly show that. It wasn't a big difference, but it was enough to pay for. for pay, to justify the expense of purchasing an IBM computer. Yes, or, or, or leasing one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so that we, led to a whole lot of other things, and, and eventually that led to, a, to us looking at uh, Paul and I, Paul Gilmore and I, we looked at a lot of data, and, and we saw some very strange things. And uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go into too much mathematical detail, but uh, we unexpectedly saw in the data that if the once the 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 the, the roll got to a certain width, everything got simpler. It repeated. Okay. in a certain way. Okay. And it could be interpreted in terms of group theory and uh, period of dis It led to a whole uh, theory of corner polyhedra and so on. And, th and the paper, which I think is my best, uh, the best paper I ever wrote, uh, is called Some Polyhedra Connected um, Related to Combinatorial Problems. Okay. And that, that's, yeah. 
And this was, and so this yeah. was while you were at IBM, and essentially yeah. a derivative of the work with the paper mills. Yeah, you see, I, I, I really believe that practical problems uh, can lead to theory, and I showed that. And so, yeah. were there other practical problems that you were exposed to during that time at IBM? It, yes, but this is the this is the one that really had had legs. Yeah. Right. I mean, okay. we did multi TC. Who and I wrote a paper entitled "Multi Terminal Network Flows," so that you could get, calculate the flows in a network, mm -hmm. and that's been quite well, well known. And that I imagine was derived from some practical problem that you were seeing at the time? That one less so, I think. I mean, okay. we, we simultaneously were pushing forward in the usual way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so at that time, yes. you, the, the IBM math department yes. is just starting with you mm -hmm. and your colleagues there. Well, no, we were just at one small group within it. Within it? Yeah, it was a whole department. Of math? Yeah, headed by Hermann Goldstein, who had been von Neumann's collaborator. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And did they give like a title to your group? They seemed like. Did, did they give a title to your group? I forget what we were called, but I think it's some, probably something like optimization. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, how do you, at that time? Yes. And this may be hard to answer given your role at IBM as it evolved, mm -hmm. what do you think was the balance of doing theoretical math versus practical math within the IBM math department? It was mostly theoretical because it, it wasn't set up to, to, uh, to be practical. I mean, there was no, well, we struggled to find out about the paper mill problem. I see, yeah. okay. We weren't connected to other parts of IBM. I see. Yeah. It wasn't that people were scorning it, it wasn't there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So now, while at IBM, your yeah. career mm -hmm. then developed, you went from yeah. managing this small group of mm -hmm. optimizers, we can mm -hmm. call them, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you went on to then lead the math department for yeah, a few years. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, how, what, how did you make the transition mm -hmm. from being part of a small group to leading the math department and then eventually become director of research? Well, I think it was just, um, <clears throat> I don't, I, I, I've, I've never, I don't have a problem being a manager. Uh, I think I do that naturally. So I, I didn't have a problem being head of the math department and then when, um, a few, after a few years, they needed a new uh, director of research. I, they uh, picked me. Okay. Yeah. But that that was going to be different, okay? Because now ten years had elapsed, and, and I, I I went to see my new boss, Frank Carey. This a one year when he wasn't the head of IBM, but he was my boss, and then he became the head. CEO. And I said, Frank, um, what do you want from the research division? And he said, I, he thought a little bit, he said, I don't want to be surprised by new technology. Because the technologies were changing, you know, very rapidly at that time. And I listened very carefully and I, I thought, well, I could do that with a staff of maybe 20, 30 people. I have 1,200 or so. And uh, I don't, I think, I think this, this whole model isn't going to work, okay? We've got to do something for IBM that counts and that helps the company, right? Uh, and, and all my previous exposure to McDonald Douglas and uh, things that made me skeptical, I, I, I could believe that we could, we could all be on the wrong track, all these companies, mm -hmm. okay? And so I started working on how do we connect to IBM? And that was a tough, slow thing 
We tried on that. You, how much do you want to hear about that? Well, um, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. want to come back to that. Okay. Because I did have a question, because you yeah. were mentioning yeah. that you sort of, you, you always felt kind of natural in management. Yes. But there's a, I know I've had spoken to many of my colleagues yeah. who have had research careers or been involved mm -hmm. as doing the work, right? Yeah, right, sure. Proving the theorems, yeah. writing the code, whatever yeah. it, it may be. Yeah. And then you make a transition to management uh -huh. where you um, frankly don't have the time to do the things that you started off on. Yeah. How did you manage that transition from you know, solving interesting problems well, to see, becoming more of a manager? Uh, you see, for me, they, they aren't different. I'm, I'm not a, a mathematician. I'm not a physicist. I just like thinking. And believe me, uh, if you have 1,200 people and you want to make them useful, you have to think and invent. It's, for me, it's the same process. Okay. Okay. And that, I, I'm glad you brought that out because that's just, I've always been that way. Right. So the reason I think I, I don't, I didn't feel it was much of a transition is just I was changing subject matter. But it was a new challenging problem. A new challenging problem, and there wasn't any, it, it had to be invented, it wasn't lying there. Right. Okay. So, so that then leads into uh, yeah. what we were just yeah. talking about is mm -hmm. you had to change this IBM culture where now the research was going to be more beneficial to the company. Yes. Um, yeah. So, uh, not, can you give some examples of yeah. how that occurred? Yeah. Well, the first thing I tried was I got all my direct reports, the people who reported me, and we toured the development divisions, the divisions where they design the product before it goes into, into uh, manufacturing. That's called development. And these were, the products here yeah. then were... Well, the products were, exactly, the yeah. Computers, I guess typewriters were big then. Yeah, but of course, the development divisions, um, some of them would be a component, a uh, semiconductor. Okay. Okay. Disk drive. So right. more like that. Okay. okay. Yeah. And, uh, wow. Uh, first of all, they had no clue as to what we could do or not do. Secondly, if it was important to them, they wanted to do it themselves. Okay. So it was a little bit like, we're going there and saying, how can we help you? And they're saying, invent anti-gravity. That'd be really <laughs> good, you know. <laughs> they didn't know what we could or couldn't do, but uh, so well, mainly got out of that was an appreciation of how difficult the problem was, right? But over time, we learned, uh, uh, much more, and a very significant uh, innovation was that I said, look, we are going to be responsible for transferring our te technology into development, okay? Now, we would try, people had ideas about a better printer or better uh, something, and they'd go to the development people and development people say, we can't take that, blah, 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 blah. Sometimes they had good reasons, right? Because they were on a schedule, right? They, they had to have the design complete. Right. And now you're showing, showing up in the middle of that schedule with something better. That's great. Go away, all right? And so uh, I learned that what we were doing didn't make sense necessarily, all right? But so I said, we're going to be responsible for transferring our technology. And you can't, without my approval or the approval of one of them, you can't turn off the attempt. And if you think you're right and they're wrong, we will appeal that to the top management of the company. Okay. Okay. That made people realistic. Okay. And so they started to learn. Uh, what was really needed, and when it was really needed. I see. And both sides got confidence and knowledge of each other. 
And finally, we ended up with something called joint programs. Uh, and I would credit Jim McGrady, who eventually became the second director of research after me, with coming up with this notion, which, by the way, we, I got that out. We went to Japan for, in the days when Japan was really learning how to do everything. Uh, because there were patent exchanges and stuff. And we saw how the Japanese did things. And it was with government aid. They were getting into subjects they'd never been in before. It was very impressive. All right, and this, I'm bringing this in because it comes up later. Okay. okay. So we saw uh, that they t uh, took all these things. Uh, we learned something from them. And we came up with uh, the concept of joint programs, which meant that the most advanced part of the development and the end research formed a single unit, uh, say for, uh, for the next generation of semiconductors, or the two generations, mm -hmm. okay? And the semiconductor division was happy with that because they didn't quite know what to do with their most advanced group. And we were happy because we tied the two together. And there was no, no one put up any money, you see? Okay. And both sides felt they gained. The, 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 the semiconductor division said, oh, at last we got something rational happening in this, in this thing, which isn't our main problem anyway, so we'll get back to work. And then by the time I retired from IBM, I think we had 18 joint programs, and they worked like a charm. They really worked well. Yeah. So while you were um, mm -hmm. director of research at yeah. IBM, right. what would you view, I mean, you were overseeing 1,200 people. I imagine it grew it during grew. your tenure. It grew, yeah. uh, How large was it when you left? Oh, I think it was around 1,500 or something. And, yeah. and by and, then, and we were getting good people too. And it and and it yeah. wasn't just the activity here in New York. No, the, we had, right. The other labs were starting to grow and under your leadership. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Um, did did you start any of the other labs? No, they were all. Uh, I, I think we we had a lab in San Jose which became the Almaden Lab. I think I think I was the director when when it grew into the new. But it was a. They were there. They were there. Okay. They were there. Yeah. And, and then I think the others were the Zurich. Zurich. That's it. And that was also there when you would... Absolutely. Okay. And they had the world's most underrated uh, uh, um, lab manager, Karsten Drangide, a Norwegian. Underrated in what way? He never, he was a very, he never got credit for anything. His lab produced two Nobel Prizes. But he didn't get the, well... The no one ever mentions Karsten yeah. during yeah. Is the, um, yeah. so what do you view, I mean, mm -hmm. you were director of IBM Research for 18 years, was it? Something like that. And yeah. what, and leading this large organization, yeah. what do you view as the most significant accomplishments of IBM Research during your ten tenure? Well, probably uh, we invented a relational database. Right. Which all of you use. Yes. <laughs> well, you may not know it. <laughs> right. That's a, that's a kind of a, that changes every, that's a, that's a tremendous changer. thing. Right. Uh, we also invented uh, what's called the RISC computer, mm -hmm. which, which runs faster. Right. With the same amount of <laughs> everything. Uh, and that's a very big thing. Um, but we also did, and much less obvious, a lot of little things because when there were manu real manufacturing problems, you see, we had knowledge that others did not have. You, you take a wire and you say it's connecting one, one uh, circuit to another, or one semiconductor uh, chip to another, and you run current through it. Okay, current runs through wires, the laws are never known. Right? But when the wires get really thin, the current starts to carry away atoms. This was called the crack strike problem. So just running it destroyed it. Okay. okay. Now your engineers don't know about that material problem, but our physicists can understand it. 
And they realized that by putting in certain other atoms in with the whatever this conductor was, all right, let's say, right, they could stop this process. Let's see. Okay. So that kind of knowledge, uh-oh, here we go, all right? We, we can't make this stuff work because when we run it, it cracks. That kind of knowledge, if you're then coming from a trusted source, and we were t pretty much together in those days, um, can make all the difference. So we had a role in fixing things. Okay. And, and crack, that particular example is just a big one, but there were a lot of little ones. So we had knowledge that they didn't have. They knew all sorts of stuff that we didn't know. And so we worked out a role for ourselves. Include the, it, so m much of the, uh, of the uh, division's contribution was things like that. I see. Okay. Now and you mentioned software, too. Yeah. You, and you mentioned earlier yeah. about um, that there was two Nobel Prizes yeah. that were awarded to members yeah. of IBM Research while you were leading. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so can you say a little bit about those? And, yeah. and I think you had an interesting story to tell yeah. about how yeah. they were published. Well, they, they, um, they were both uh, done at the Zurich lab, okay. under the, which was Carson Drangon's place, okay, he gets no credit. Uh, I don't know whether, the, anyway, uh, the, the, the chaps who, who invented the scanning tunnel microscope, um, um, they were, they didn't have any any technician, and I was visiting. I was. I said, "We've got to get to a technician. You, we have to move one out of the physical sciences thing." And the head of physical sciences objected to that. And I said, "Well," and I, and I very rarely did this kind of thing. We have to do this. Right? He quit the next week. and went on to win the next Nobel Prize by inventing high temperature superconductivity. He was a much better researcher than a manager. Sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I really uh, very seldom gave that kind of uh, correction. Yeah. But it produced two Nobel Prizes. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, I think we were yeah. talking earlier about mm -hmm. um, but, but uh, if we're talking about the contributions, uh, this is not a contribution to IBM, but to the world, Benoit Mandelbrot, his uh, invention of fractals. Right. All right. That's, that's a, just a world-changing thing. Yeah. And we, and, we and see him in animation all, every day. Yes. Right. So that's, that's a, a tremendous contribution. And, 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 I'll claim credit because I, when I met Ben, I said this guy's different, right. and I really struggled to get him help, and he appreciated it, and he thanks me in his book. Yeah. So you were mentioning earlier we were talking yeah. about in the Nobel Prizes that mm -hmm. IBM yeah. was a bit uh, reluctant to yeah. publicize it. Do you mind telling that story? Well, that, that, yeah, I didn't. I, <laughs> I, well, we we thought we were candidates with the scanning tunnel microscope. I think it was, and. Um, so I went to see, by that time, my, John Akers was the CEO, and um, I went to see him. We didn't get along that well, but, but you know, we were very different. And um, I said, I think we might win this thing. He said, uh -huh. and uh, I said, We'll, we'll probably get a phone call in the morning. Do you want me to call you and wake you up? He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we did win it. And I said, oh, great. Let's advertise that we've won this thing. You know, Bell Labs is always rubbing it into us that they win a Nobel Prize and we don't. Uh, 
It'll be good for hiring people, good for the representation of IBM. He wouldn't do it. I could, at that time, I didn't understand why. Now I do. He had a good reason. And that reason was? And the reason was that the world has started to change. And <clears throat> the influence of the shareholders, which really were, were, were um, all financial, the big ones were financial firms, their influence was you've got to get results now, next quarter or at the end of the year. And research they viewed as an expense that might produce something in the future. So basically, the shareholders represented by the financial firms were against the firms that invested in research. And John, I think correctly, I'm, and I'm just attributing this reason to him in retrospect, but very likely was, was saying, I don't want I'm not going to advertise the fact that we're, we won a Nobel Prize, because that, that's like saying, you're doing basic research. It wasn't. It was very applied research. Right. It didn't matter. Nobel Prize means... We're basic research. Yeah. So I never could get him to do it, and I didn't understand that at the time. But I saw that then o over and over again in every company. Yeah. Right, and I think later yeah. on, I think mm -hmm. you've yeah. talked about the role yeah. and, and written about Mm -hmm. And I think we'll get to your work at the Sloan Foundation mm -hmm. about the impact yeah. of research, the interactions between science and technology in the firm. Yes. So we'll table that thought for okay. the moment. I wanted to, to mm -hmm. finish up the discussion about your leadership at IBM Research. Yeah. Um, could you, are you able to contrast today's IBM Research environment with the one that you left behind? Well, uh, I can contrast the environment. I, I, I have not kept in touch with IBM Research. Okay. That's a quarter of a century since I left. Right. Okay. And I, when I leave, I, I say... Goodbye. Good, God bless you. <laughs> right. And, but I can say the environment, meaning the environment around IBM, as far as research is concerned, and any other company, is, very, is a very poor one. In what way? Pretty much... What I was trying to explain, that, that the, the shareholders are, are very short, uh, on a very short fuse. They buy, uh, they don't know much about the company. They buy it and sell. The average uh, share of stock is held only for less than a year. Right. Uh, and long range investment like is, is frowned on. And so, uh, I imagine then you would say that if you look at today, yeah. the, you know, I know years ago in the time when IBM Research, mm -hmm. um, when you were there, you, know, you had companies like GE and yeah. AT&T, mm -hmm. et cetera, yeah. that were investing in mm -hmm. basic research. Yes. And that's dis that generally has disappeared. IBM is one of the few companies that's left yeah. with the basic research. But, and that's because I thought it was going to happen. <laughs> and I spent... 18 years figuring out ways to make them directly okay. useful. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, that was solving that a problem for me. Right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. after years of leading IBM research, right. you yeah. left IBM to join the Sloan Foundation. Yes. Uh, what were the factors that led you to make that change? Well, there was one big factor. Okay. I would have I would have stayed on. All right. Except I reached the magic age of 60. And at that time, officers of the company, and I was at that time a senior vice president, uh, had to retire at 60. So how did you end up at Sloan? Oh, well, that was quite natural. Um, they needed a, a new president. I mean, the, their president was retiring. And uh, the, The people, I knew the people on the board, they knew me. It was, you know, uh, the world of, of, um, of technology and science is, has, the leaders know each other. I see. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So they talked to me and I said, look, if you, if you, I have some things on my mind 
that I want to do that I couldn't do at IBM. And here I told them about some of them. They said, if you, if you want me, I want to be able to do these things. And they said, sure. It wasn't the, they didn't have a search firms and all that stuff. Right, all that okay. stuff, that's it, yeah. okay. Yeah. So I know during your yeah. time at Sloan, yeah. you, you wrote articles about the often, often misunderstood relationships yes. between science, technology, productivity, and a successful economy, yes. which was influenced by your time at IBM. Very much so, yeah. Um, yeah. Can you, so you, you had really two roles. I mean, you yeah. were writing, doing your own authoring things. You were also leading yeah. the organization. So sure. let's first talk about your own personal contributions while at Sloan. What would you view yeah. from that time as some of the, your key contributions uh, and writings from that time? In my own research. In your that, own work, yes. Yeah. Um, I think very clearly um, it was a, a fundamental contribution to the theory of trade. You see, I'd been exposed to the Japanese thing. Mm -hmm. And so I thought there's something wrong with this notion that if you just leave everything alone, uh, everything is good for everybody in trade. Mm -hmm. right? First of all, the Japanese weren't leaving things alone. Right? And um, secondly, uh, they were growing. They were getting into the industries that we had and taking part of them. They were, their, their economy was not static. You see, generally the economists had looked at, and there were uh, exceptions to this, a static model, say, okay, you've got these capabilities, I've got these capabilities, we trade, we're better off. And that's right, mm -hmm. by the way. Right? But the difference is, hey, the capabilities can be acquired. See, it was, it was hard to grow grapes in England and acquire the, what Portugal was good at and all that stuff. But, uh, so the question is, what, what happens when a comp your trading partner is getting good at different things, all right? And um, I teamed up with Will Baumol, the, who a very well-known economist, and wrote a book on that subject. Okay. And I was helped enormously by a, a former classmate uh, who had become a professor of economics at Yale, Herbert Scarf. Mm -hmm. Herb taught me what the relevant equations were, and uh, I was able, I, they were, I could really solve them, <laughs> right? But most economists couldn't do that. So, so you were yes. able to sort of bring back your old mathematical talents right into, into this work. Absolutely. That was, it was crucial. B both uh, linear and integer programming uh, enabled me to show, and, and, and Will helped me, um, as a former head of the uh, economics, anyway, a very well-known economist. He just died, unfortunately. And uh, uh, we wrote, I, I wrote an article taking a standard model and introducing economies of scale. That's where the integers come in. I see. Yeah. And uh, then he and I wrote a book together, which was uh, endorsed on the back by a Nobel Prize winner and the leading uh, person in international trade. So it had high level acceptance, mm -hmm. okay? But it was not what anyone wanted to hear because the title of the book was Global Trade and Conflicting National Interests. Because what we showed in the book was what's what's good for one country if, it, if it's growing can very easily be bad for the other. Then there's, fund, there's a fundamental conflict. Right. Uh, it's, it, there's a place in the middle that's good, but it's unstable. Both of them can gain if they can push the other one away. All right. So that's not a picture that anyone wanted. And so it's, it, it's uh, been, uh, uh, things of our, our corporations have gone cheerfully on 
moving the jobs overseas and everything and doing things that are harmful to the country right. uh, and saying, well, this is just free trade. But it isn't. It's more than that. It's changing our capabilities and theirs. Right. And that can be damaging and has been damaging. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was, that was, I asked the question about mm -hmm. your individual contributions. Yes. But then you were also leading this foundation that was um, leading a number of different key initiatives. Yes. So which ones of those initiatives that you were yeah. overseeing, yeah. maybe not directly involved in, yes. uh, were you most proud of while you were at Sloan? I think the, the one I'm certainly most proud of um, was one that um, we could never have done without the support of the foundation uh, board and money, okay? Which is, we took the idea of online learning, which didn't exist really, um, Frank, I, I was able to persuade Frank Mayados, who had run the Almaden lab for me, in, to come with me to Sloan, because th things were getting tough in IBM, and he saw, hey, we've got some, we, we can do something at this other place. And um, so we took seriously, and which people didn't at that time, the notion that you could You'd call it today online learning, but you couldn't call it that then because there was no in, no internet. Yeah, there was no line to be on. There was nothing <laughs> to be online. Okay, right. there were companies would have a, their own uh, thing. Internal networks. Internal efforts, and uh, they, 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 there were some proprietary systems they could buy, but it'd just be. Mm -hmm. right. But there were a few people who thought you could learn that way. That, that was a, and different, different ideas. And so Frank and I said, we're going to make this thing happen, okay? And uh, we developed something we called, a, a certain style of learning called ALN, which stood for a very catchy, asynchronous learning network, okay? So you could, you could, um, you have a professor, regular professor, and um, he puts up his lectures, let's say, as text. By the way, all this is on phone lines, right. no broadband. That's ever. right, no video. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, phone lines can carry text. So he, he's got his lecture up there and uh, examples and homework and stuff. And you read it and you react to it and you send in your stuff your homework or whatever. And it was asynchronous because not only did you not have to be there for the lecture, but it could, you could do your work at any time. Uh, right. You could read this when you had time to read it. Right. Okay. Which is exactly how the online learning is work, working today. Of course. Yeah. But uh, that, uh, and the, of course, no one thought that Anyway, we could find people who, would do, who were willing to try it. And we even found a few people who had taught a course, not like, quite exactly like that. Okay. And, but uh, we started to do it, and we were lucky. I mean, we got, we had got everyone in the U.S. who was interested around one table, all right, 20, 25. And we said, we'll fund this kind of stuff, all right try it, and, and, and some of them wanted to. And um, we were, we, uh, there were a lot of uh, very good guys, and it started, and it seemed to work. They, they all did different things, but we stuck to the asynchronous model, model throughout. And then, uh, and it was working, the people were, uh, and, and there were natural, one very smart thing we did was we refused, the, but places like MIT wouldn't touch it, or Harvard, okay. They wouldn't use it. They said, well, if you want it, we'll do an experiment for you. We'll test your thing against a normal classroom, okay. And one thing we were smart about was we wouldn't touch it. 
a normal classroom, and, and this background helps, is highly developed. Right? It's been around for many years. They do a lot of little things right. This thing, it's the first. It's all new. It's all new. It's all clumsy. I don't care how, right? I, I don't want the bad news. I know it'll be bad. Right? So we wouldn't touch any, anybody who wanted to, to test. Mm -hmm. We just we funded people who wanted to do it I see. for whatever crazy okay. reason. Right. And it started, and, and it seemed to be working, and they st started getting better at it. And then we were lucky. The Internet appeared. So that took a lot of the burden of learning away. Okay. And then it really took off. Uh, each year we had an annual uh, meeting and bigger. I right. think, I think by, I don't know how big, it was a few million people coupled by, by the year 2000 or 2001. And I think by 2004 there were four or five or six million people taking courses for credit at established schools and paying for it. But the, you see, they could pay for it because they could keep working. That was the, we wanted to do something for people who couldn't afford to take the time off to go to college. college right. Reference my farmer. Right. Okay. I believed in those people. That's uh, right. Yeah. That's right. So those, those yeah. give those people opportunities, the yeah. working people opportunity because to learn. It was, you couldn't make a living farming anymore, really. Right. It turned into something else. And so it, it, it became a huge success. And most people don't know about it because after we'd done this and had all these millions of people, finally the Harvards and MITs and so forth said, oh, well, or Stanford put, started putting courses online right. with no support, no credit, and no charge. They were just giving it away. Right. And everybody, oh, my God, these MOOCs, they called them. Right. They've just invented online learning. <laughs> Without knowing that there was some foundational work done. By well, the uh, no, that we had a working thing that, that people got credit and paid for. Right. And no one got credit for, for these things. And, and most people dropped right out of it. Right. Well, yes. and, well and the other part, as yes. you're saying, is you know, now it's online learning in 2017. You know, yep. It's very common. Everybody knows you can get yep. degrees 100% yeah. online from All universities. Of that is, yeah. You, we're, we're rewinding the clock now 20 or so years yeah. to when you were experimenting and developing the concept. Well, the, 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 things, the things that the MITs and Harvards did were not what we proposed. We proposed right. a professor and interaction with them. Right. Okay. The MOOCs, the massive online courses, had none of those things. They just put up the course. You put up the material and you take, do it when you want. Good luck. Right. Right. Uh, and that doesn't work for most people. Right. Works for some people. But no, even if it worked for them, they got no credit. So they've gradually modified. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, mostly the, um, um, the, the schools, I mean, you've got to give people support. Right. And so, so anyway, that was a that was a huge success. It really was, and, and I like having the chance to talk about it because most people don't know it ever happened. Well, no, it's, yeah. and that's yeah. I, that's a great story. <laughs> that's absolutely a great story. Yeah. All right. So mm -hmm. besides the uh, yeah. project at, yeah. about online learning at yes. Sloan, yeah. uh, were there other projects that you were involved in leading at Sloan that you're proud of? Yes, there really <clears throat> there really are. There there are many, and, and I. I can't name them all in this. Uh, so they pick this, your top three. Yes, but I, I, I will. One of them, in, in, with the um, online learning, that was, um, you know, partly my idea. Um, but with the things I'm going to describe now, my only role was being able to recognize, all right, and help people. Um, the the. Um, the census of marine life was just a, a wonderful thing. Uh, Jesse Osabel uh, really thought it up, a very independent-minded person. 
and, uh, and made it happen. And, and it made, he was able to galvanize a worldwide program. We supplied the money. Mm -hmm. He supplied the, uh, and uh, the first attempt to see what life is, is in the oceans, what's there and not there, and uh, where, what is the life of the animals? For instance, where do the whales go? Okay. Okay. And you see, with satellites and things, you can actually follow some of the marine animals and find out that they, where they go, at what season, they cross the oceans, they meet over here, they breed, they s scatter, uh, what, what that whole pattern is, mm -hmm. for example, for whales. Okay. And uh, you can tag animals and then listen to what they do. So we shed an enormous amount of light for the first time on what's in the ocean. Right? I see. Yeah. This, we called it the census of marine life. And it, and it was a, a really wonderful idea of his. And uh, it was a good way to use the foundation's money. That was a great project. Yeah. And, uh, a, and another, uh, a similar thing that was um, the Sloan Sky Survey, in which we put up the money to build a new kind of telescope, which was uh, called the Sloan, and it's still called the Sloan. Right? And it was totally automated, uh, and all the results from this, this it, it was built to uh, it, it, it could you know, count the, scar, uh, the, the, the stars and how much they are deviated. I mean, it, it could take in enormous masses of data wasn't limited to a person, right? Okay. And all of that flowed into a data bank which everybody could use. So it was a new kind of open astronomy in addition. And <coughs> it has shed an uh, enormous, you can look it up in, in Wikipedia or anything, mm -hmm. light on, on the distribution of dark matter. It turns out that most of the universe is made up of dark matter and okay. things like that. So it, it really has added to our understanding That's of cool. the universe. That's very cool. So it was very, uh, a very good program. And I'll just say that we also continued uh, to study industries. And later this week, I'm going to a meeting of the Industry Studies Association, which Sloan, Sloan founded, and is still going and studying different industries, say, the financial measures are not enough, right? Right. You have to understand how it works. Okay. And these people study that. So those are more. There are tons more. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, let's move on now yeah. to your, uh, yeah. about 10 years ago, you left to yeah. join NYU. I think mm -hmm. you're a research professor in the business school. That's correct, yeah. And um, from your bibliography, it seems you came back to doing some work in your programming. I remember seeing yeah. you within the past 10 years speak at a conference yeah. about some of your more recent things. Yeah. Um, how did you make that transition from having not really worked deeply in the field mm -hmm. since the Gomery Cut Game days? Oh. Oh, please, no, no, not since then. I mean, that, <laughs> I did an awful lot after that. No, it, it wouldn't. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I, it was more, I, I didn't do that much work. Uh, I, mostly, uh, as <clears throat> down at NYU, I collaborated uh, with Will Baumol mm -hmm. on more economics, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> often using... Uh, uh, a linear and integer programming. I see. And um, also with um, a very, um, Richard Silla, a well-known historian of, of economics. Okay. On how the change came about in the American corporations. So it, I really spent most of my time on pursuing the other, some of my other directions understanding the corporation, the motivations of them, I see. and so forth, and collaborating with people in those areas. Yes, I did 
do some work, but it was mostly tied to um, um, not, you know, not cutting planes, please, that was so long ago. It was <laughs> all the things that had come out of that, like the, the study of corner polyhedra right. and so forth. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it was mostly retrospective. I see. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, you, can you, yeah. you know, you've written, uh, you've mm -hmm. written about, while at uh, NYU, about issues related to your interest in economics. Yes. Um, I think you mentioned earlier yeah. during your schooling days, you had, yeah. you were, when you were in college, yeah. you just said, when they, getting into the physics of the atom, you said, well, maybe this economic stuff is more interesting. Yes. yes. Um, can you talk about how uh -huh. that evolved from your early exposure in college through your time at IBM yes. and at Sloan, Sloan Foundation, mm -hmm. um, how your, your interest in economics, including the roles of the corporation and free trade, has mm -hmm. evolved and how it connects between those experiences? Well, I think the, the, the um, actually, um, it started while I was still at Princeton, the two year stint at Princeton. Mm -hmm. um, there was a young, I was assistant professor, by the, Will Balmo was an assistant professor, okay? And we wrote a paper together in which we tried to interpret the economic meaning of cutting planes. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So that's how we got together, okay? So that was 1958 or something. Yeah, nine, say like 50, 60 years ago. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so, um, when I had time and, and motivation to pursue the, uh, what I thought were problems in trade with Japan and all that kind of stuff, uh, it was natural for me to um, look up Will, and Will was a professor in the business school. Yeah, here at NYU? Yeah, at NYU. Okay. So um, there wasn't that much transition. It was more like we're just resuming. I see. <laughs> well, as I say, we wrote the, and we'd already gotten together, we wrote the book. So it, really NYU has been a continuation of all the things that I have thought about. Right. Yeah. Right. And you continue to be productive yeah. yes. today uh, yes. in terms of writing and, and thinking I about different things. even write things aimed at Capitol Hill <laughs> and published in the Hill magazine. Uh, um, if, yeah. So let's, um, we took a break and I know we were, during the break, we were, mm -hmm. we, you talked about how there seems to be yeah. a common theme coming out yeah. as you look at your long career. Yeah. About, uh, and even going back, I think, to your time in, at, the, the, uh, at the school when you were a young, yes. young man. It all comes back to the school, I right, think. <laughs> about, about understanding, uh, you know, yeah. understanding how things work and why yeah. things work. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It, it seems, and you're still looking at that today. I am still interested. Um, I'm so, still learning stuff, too. <laughs> so I'd like to get, yeah. um, t yeah. turn us a little bit back on to yeah. operations research and, sure. and optimization. Yes. From your perspective, mm -hmm. how do you think, do you have opinions on how you feel, the think, how the field of operations research has developed over time from when you were first introduced it into the well, 50s then, to where it is know, today? I, I think there's been tremendous... Uh, progress. Uh, and uh, there's been, you see, it, it, the, the surroundings for company, companies, I think, have become difficult. The surroundings for analyzing and using OR and the methodology have become much better, okay? Like 10 times better every 10 years, right. all right? Now, you, which means that since, since I was in uh, Princeton, a million times at least. Right. Better, right. Because instead of having a room that only a few people could put in a pro I have in my jacket pocket here something much more powerful okay, right. and easy to, to use. So, the, ability, the sheer overwhelming ability to use this 
uh, just has helped make it possible to analyze things and data to an extent that uh, I don't see how OR can miss. I mean, we, we may not even call it OR, we might call it what we always do. This is what we just normally do, okay? <laughs> Well, you know, yeah. we always were this, we have these debates now about you yeah. know the should we keep calling it operations research yeah. management science or should we call it advanced analytics? Yeah, you know, there's yeah. the, the, or, the buzzword or, or, of data uh, science is the buzzword and, of the and, day. And, and the advanced analytics is very hard to separate from uh, artificial intelligence. Right. Okay. And so, it's and we're in a benign uh, situation for doing the kinds of things that we used to call uh, operations research. Right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so uh, are you able to take a perspective? I realize now yeah. much of your work is more in the economics and mm -hmm. where your thinking has been. Yeah. Um, do you have a perspective as how you see that the field is going? I mean, maybe we've kind of answered that. I think, uh, I, I, I think I've, I've done my best. Your best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I want to end with uh, this following question, which yes. I know you said would be a difficult one to answer, but mm -hmm. you know I'm going to ask it anyway. Mm -hmm. So you've had a long and illustrious ca career. Yeah. Um, you know, I've done a number of these interviews with yeah. a number of the you know, founding people in, yeah. in math programming, and, and your mm -hmm. career yeah. has certainly had a lot of diversity to it. Mm -hmm. um, the OR community certainly knows about your fundamental contributions mm -hmm. in discovering inertial programming. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, yeah. how would you like to be remembered? Well, I think um, uh, I think I would like to be remembered as someone who had a lot of ability to invent and solve problems and tried to use them in good ways. So the good ways as an example, like the, the, the online learning? Like online le learning, right. or getting to the roots of why trade is having a negative impact on the country mm -hmm. in the hope of changing that. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing, yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's really great. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I certainly know, uh, hopefully this video will help preserve yeah. Uh, some of that. Thank um, you. I yeah. want to th thank you for your time today. It's uh, been a real pleasure having this conversation with you. Well, it, it's been a, a, a real pleasure for me to, to be able to talk about these things. So I want to thank you. You made it very easy and you are very helpful. All right. Thank yeah. you, Ralph. Thank you.